Hello and welcome to Introduction to Remote Sensing. This course is listed in four ways. Um, it is both under the GR, Geography, and NR, Natural Resources sections, and then there are um, an undergraduate 323 level and graduate 503 level. And I'm just going to talk briefly about definitions for remote sensing and then why we do remote sensing and some of the interesting applications. Uh, who am I? I'm Michael Lefsky. I am your professor for this semester. Um, and my background is primarily in LIDAR remote sensing. So LIDAR remote sensing is a tool we use to measure the height and elevation of objects. And my applications have been in the realm of forest ecology. So if you look at uh, that top center panel, that um, image shows the height of the canopy uh, for an area at the top of Joes National Forest in Brazil. On the right is some work that a graduate student did uh, with me actually mapping the three-dimensional structure of individual trees. At the bottom left is um, a global map of forest height that I developed using some satellite LIDAR data. And at the right just shows the projects I've been involved, the ISAT and ISAT-2 um, missions, missions that were predominantly um, about uh, estimating ice sheet elevation, but um, I use the data for forest height estimation. Brief definition, uh, ASPRS, the American Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, um, uh, years back adopted a combined definition of the two subsets um, that uh, are uh, covered by the society. And so it's the art, the science, and the technology of obtaining information about physical objects in the environment by recording, measuring, and interpreting imagery and digital representations of energy patterns, um, specifically derived from non-contact sensor systems. So it's remote. We uh, want to develop solutions that don't require us to actually go out and make measurements um, that contact the objects of interest. And the phrase remote sensing uh, was coined by Evelyn Pruitt. Um, photogrammetry, I should mention, is the process of measuring objects from photos. Uh, so we have sort of two big subsets of remote sensing, one of which is photogrammetry, the other one of which is photo interpretation, which is about getting information about the identification of um, or identity of objects in remotely sensed uh, data. But why do we do remote sensing? Well, you know, there are some observations we want to make that are either too expensive, too dangerous, uh, too remote, or too time dependent to make any other way. So too expensive. Um, a map of forest height globally could be done uh, in the field, but uh, sending people out everywhere would be too expensive to, to be practical. Um, deforestation in the Amazon, again, um, sending people out um, just isn't practicable. And the concentration of plankton along coastlines, you could go out in their sample, but you know, that's uh, again, You'd have to have a, a fleet of ships to do that. Uh, some applications, it's too dangerous. So for instance, um, fire temperature is mapped for um, ongoing fires. Obviously, you don't want to send people out there with thermometers. So we do this from airborne platforms. Um, too remote, um, ocean temperature. Um, ocean temperature is a very important um, uh, variable to get at both for say global change studies but also for um, developing meteorological projections uh, but 
sending boats out would just be um, too difficult to do and too time dependent. So for instance, again, um, fire temperature, you really want to have updates um, every day so that you can plan out um, your operations um, over a large fire. That would just take an enormous amount of time, even if you didn't have safety issues. And uh, particularly for hazards applications, so like flood extent or hurricane tracking, that's something you really want to have um, uh, to get out and record those quickly and maybe update very frequently. So you can't do that other than using some kind of remote sensing. Um, and there are some observations we want to make that just can't be made any other way, uh, regardless of expense. Um, physical properties that we can't detect with our sensors. So for some applications, we're interested in uh, passive uh, microwave emittance. Passive microwave emittance is just the, the uh, intensity of microwaves being emitted from the land surface. And that's a, a useful property in terms of snow depth mapping. Um, but we can't detect that with our senses. Um, there are some physical properties we can detect uh, ourselves, but remote sensing can provide in more detail. And there are some physical properties we can detect, but remote sensing provides them in a digital form that uh, allows us to then use mathematical and statistical approaches to um, turn into information products. And going back, there are physical properties we can detect, but remote sensing allows us to see them over a wider extent. And so this is a map uh, or an image, I'm sorry, of plankton on the northern coast of Norway. And that's the cyan, sort of blue-green color near the coasts. And um, you could go out there and do sampling, but this gives you it over a much larger area. And some observations just haven't been recorded anyway. So uh, this is the uh, CSU campus and the adjacent residential area to the east um, um, in 1937. And, you know, there, there are very few or, or no uh, maps of this detail that you can get for 1937. Just to orient yourself near the top edge, you, you can see the oval um, with a series of trees down the center of it. Those trees are still there. You can also see smaller trees around the edge of the oval. And those are trees that are still there today, uh, but they're much larger. Um, and we can observe processes of change over a period of time uh, by using multiple images. So 1937, 41, 50, 69, 99, and then 2005. And um, the 1950 and, uh, and 41 images are interesting because what it shows is that, you know, the areas that today are uh, Moby and some of the playing fields uh, were still all agricultural fields at that time. Uh, an application that, that I wrote um, compares some images I put together for the Colorado Front Range um, as it appeared in 1960 and compares it to the current view. Um, and if you use that URL at the bottom, that will actually take you to uh, a kind of a Google Earth application that you can, you can pan around and zoom in and see just how much um, the, the landscape has changed just since um, the 1960s. And then finally, um, you know, I think one of the important things about remote sensing is it's really changed the way we look at the earth, both scientifically and as human beings. So I always like to bring up this comparison, you know, 
when you see old movies that um, in the, the beginning they show a logo very often the they show a, a planet uh, uh, the earth in the background and what they see is a globe um, because that's how people conceptualized the surface of the earth uh, that it looked like um, you know the the physical relief of the planet as if you were seeing it out in space well if you look at the planet from space mostly you're seeing clouds and you're picking up um, very different colors um, and this shot on the right um, is from one of the Apollo missions and this was a startling image for people uh, back in the late 1960s. Um, people just didn't um, conceive of the earth in this way and they began to see it as um, a hole that is um, they didn't see any boundaries right no political boundaries uh, and it gave people the sense that the the planet was alive and that really changed both public conceptions leading to the first Earth Day and also scientifically. And it's where a lot of the, the uh, ecosystem and Earth sciences uh, really move into uh, understanding the Earth as a total system. So, one of the primary goals of this course is for you to, to learn how to use technology and derive data products to become informed observers of the Earth system. Uh, we all have an innate ability to look at the image of the Earth's surface and extract some information from it using visual and contextual clues. But uh, much of our study of remote sensing involves systematizing these observations and developing the ability to interpret images um, that may have been created using processes that are, are really wholly unlike um, our vision or conventional photography. So to sort of ease you into the class, um, we're just going to look at a few examples of remote sensing applications. So here's a land surface process um, uh, uh, analysis. On the right, you can see um, uh, landscape with uh, agricultural areas in green and um, bare areas in uh, gray. Um, information like this can be used uh, in a classification analysis where you can map the different kinds of land cover. And um, on the left is a image from Bolivia looking at the date of deforestation. So looking at, um, this would look at multiple images um, from a, a range of years, classify them into forest and non-forest, and pick out the year that they were converted from forest to agriculture. Um, these are incredibly important um, um, data products because it allows us to track uh, deforestation and uh, overall changes in the environment that, that occur with deforestation. Um, this, uh, these kinds of analysis are so impactful that um, in this year, um, 2020, um, the Brazilian government just defunded the unit that does this mapping because the current government doesn't want people to know just how much deforestation is going on. Now that's fruitless because the imagery that they use is collected um, by um, NASA and NOAA and USGS satellites. And so anyone really can do these analyses. Um, although the Brazilian unit that does them is especially adept at doing them. Uh, but we still have a very good sense of, of what's going on. Uh, another land surface disturbance and, and recovery process on the left. Um, remote sensing is used by the U.S. Forest Service, both airborne and spaceborne um, uh, 
data to look at uh, mapping new fires uh, where you know they're remote and so people aren't seeing the fires themselves um, and also to monitor the fires um, during uh, fire suppression activities um, so that uh, they can get a sense of where they should um, devote uh, you know um, devote uh, actions to to contain them on the right is an interesting analysis so we're looking at two kinds of forest disturbance again mapping forest versus non-forest and we're looking at um, places where greenness this is an index we use it's it's technically it's ndvi we'll talk about this normalized difference vegetation index but basically it it shows areas um, um, their greenness uh, how much uh, green cover they have and in this case it's areas in yellow are areas that have increased okay so that yellow is a, a gis layer um, and uh, there's some blow-ups there that show you that in fact that increase in greenness um, represents different things in different areas so in texas that represents areas um, uh, that have increased in um, irrigated agriculture irrigated agriculture there is denoted by those red areas um, this is a kind these images are uh, color infrared and in color infrared imagery vegetation shows up as red um, in Canada uh, places that are increasing greenness seem to be mostly areas that have been logged and are now recovering so that's something that's relatively easy to pick up using uh, conventional imagery um, we can map natural and, and anthropogenic uh, so uh, human made features um, this is uh, an area at the edge of the Kalahari Desert in Namibia. So um, the, the majority of that area are sand dunes. You can also see a river in there, sort of going from the upper left uh, toward the center of the image. Um, as with the other imagery, healthy vegetation is going to appear uh, red in this image. And so if you look in the center of the large image, there's one little red dot um, and so if you blow it up as in the lower right um, you could see it's circular um, a circular area of high vegetation is um, generally a central pivot irrigation um, uh, field and so this person has access probably to a well that they're using to um, to irrigate that small area. Now it's kind of hard to tell what you're looking at in these, you know, in the larger image with these lines. Um, if we look at higher resolution, so we're we're sort of zooming in, um, we can see that what you're looking at is actually individual um, shrubs that have colonized sand dunes so the, the stripe pattern is created by sand dunes and then some of the uh, features that you're seeing that have stabilized the sand dunes are actually individual shrubs more land surface processes um, this is an image also based on ndvi but we're looking at an image that shows us the difference between uh, NDVI on one date versus the average NDVI from period and green areas are areas where you have a higher NDVI than average and brown areas are areas that have um, uh, lower NDVI than that long-term average and so at a glance and with a relatively easy uh, analysis to do uh, we can see the areas that appear to be drought stressed versus areas getting adequate um, sorry adequate uh, 
uh, water supply. Uh, atmospheric and hydrologic processes, also a major remote sensing application. Here on the right, um, it's hard to see, but if you look at the gray-black area in the upper left-hand corner, that's uh, land. And so that's the eastern uh, seaboard. So if you kind of look up near the top, there's uh, Cape Cod, and then further down, there's Long Island, and then further down, um, there's the Delmarva Peninsula and the Chesapeake Bay. And this is a thermal image. So um, we're recording the temperature of the water. And that area in red is the Gulf Stream. So the Gulf Stream is transporting uh, heat from low, elevate, uh, low out latitudes to high latitudes. And ultimately that energy uh, warms, the, uh, warms Europe. And an atmospheric process, you know, um, we use uh, uh, images of clouds, uh, cloud uh, presence and absence, and uh, precipitation maps to get at um, meteorological forecasts. So another very large application of, of remote sensing. Oh, this is a temperature anomaly map. We looked at NDVI anomalies. Um, and so this is July, 2012, and it looks at the departure of um, the current temperature during that period from a long-term average. And you can see that you've got uh, large, uh, the red areas are positive um, anomalies from the long-term average um, at the high um, latitudes in both um, hemispheres. And of course, we know that this is a very typical signature of um, global change that um, we get um, larger um, uh, positive uh, warming in the high latitudes. I don't know if you saw, but uh, this year, 2020, um, there was an area in Siberia that reached 100 degrees, uh, which is just absolutely outside the normal range. And so rather than depending on field sites, um, we can use satellite images to get at temperatures over large areas. And then those are, those maps are calibrated using field sites. Um, but rather than getting points, we're getting large areas. Um, this is a CWIFS image. So CWIFS is a satellite system that's specifically um, um, designed for ocean applications. And this is um, an NDVI. Um, measurement to get at um, greenness. And over the land, um, they're just showing you the NDVI. Over the ocean areas, that's been calibrated to show you a plankton density. So plankton, the, um, the base of the food chain in oceanic systems. And that can be mapped uh, and then related to things like temperature and uh, nutrient supply from um, uh, coastal rivers. Cryosphere processes um, an enormous area of application now because, of course, we want to be able to quantify the melting of uh, both sea and land ice. So this gives you just a, an application of sea ice, um, melting of the, the Perry Channel, um, uh, in Canada and, um, you know, maps are produced, um, every, uh, I believe every week to map the, the status of, uh, the Arctic and Antarctic sea ice extent. Um, and we also use, we were talking about LIDAR, which measures, um, elevation and height. Um, there are also LIDAR missions that measure the elevation and change in elevation for uh, land 
uh, glaciers. And then just a few uh, last images, uh, not really applications. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, uh, this is a river in the Amazon basin uh, showing you the meandering nature of this particular river in this area. Um, so we know that this is probably a, a low relief area, not much change in elevation, um, probably a, um, a large flood plain, and this allows the river to meander back and forth over time. Um, at the bottom left, we have an uplift dome in the Sahara. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, we have um, some really interesting cloud patterns. Um, the wind there is from uh, left to right or west to east, and you're seeing the down uh, wind effect of the islands themselves and their effect on cloud patterns. And the lower right, um, those are sand dunes, um, again, in the Sahara. And I just show these because I think they're lovely.